Welcome to Dog Life Radio. Hello, welcome to Dog Life Radio episode 35. I am your host, Rossi Giugio, in the mobile remote Dog Life Radio studios here in beautiful Weirs Beach, New Hampshire. We are up here at Bike Week, and I had the chance to record episode 35, or maybe I should say re-record episode 35 with Miss Brianna Morse. I uh, had an awesome conversation with her, um, she, I don't know, maybe a little over a week ago, and um, the audio just was not of good quality at all. It was actually really bad, so um, she was gracious enough to uh, loan me some more of her time, and we just had an awesome conversation today, the day that I record this intro. Um, so, again, uh, she's a... <laughs> again, again, uh, she's a licensed therapist in California, personalized and remote clients, and she is now located in South Carolina, uh, Brianna Morse. Um, she's got over 15 years of experience in this work. Uh, we felt like um, it was really timely to have this conversation. The original talk that we had was a day or two before uh, the news broke about Anthony Bourdain, um, but we, we kind of talk about this um, in the beginning of uh, our conversation. So we're going to take a quick break and come back at you with the podcast that you should be listening to, and uh, we'll take a pause for the cause right now. Hey gang, remember, life is too short for crappy coffee. Check out Death Wish Coffee at deathwishcoffee.com. They've got two signature blends. They're Odin Forest Blend, or Valhalla Java, is a smoother, more mild roast. And for those of you like myself who like a stronger, bolder flavored coffee, check out the flagship, Death Wish Coffee. Fantastic stuff. You're going to love it. It is the world's strongest coffee. Whoa. How did we get on this podcast? Uh, I'm not sure, but I like it here. It's pretty great, but we should probably tell everyone about our own podcast, Fueled by Deathcast. Hell yeah. Comes out every Thursday from the Death Wish Coffee Company, the world's strongest coffee. Every week, you can hear me, the incredible Jeff. And me, the amazing D-Man. And we talk about new science discoveries, breaking news from Death Wish Coffee, and we welcome a special guest from rock stars to astronauts and ask them all the question, what fuels you the podcast is available right on deathwishcoffee.com and wherever podcasts are found including itunes google music stitcher and more plus you can now watch it live on the death wish coffee company page on facebook and watch all our videos over on youtube all right all right now you know all about fueled by deathcast and how you can listen to it but first let's finish this podcast let's get back to the show all right, and we're back. So the podcast that you should be listening to this week uh, found a new one for us uh, called Chasing Excellence. I uh, liked it a lot. Uh, take a listen to episode 34. It was Frequently Asked Nutrition Questions. Um, this was a, I thought this one was really good for a couple of different reasons. Uh, it was about a 26 minutes long, so it's definitely uh, shorter, which is great, so you can kind of bang through it really quickly. A lot of good information. They kicked it off by doing a little bit of book review and reading review of uh, a, a lot of popular, uh, I guess, authors in the nutrition space. And then maybe five, six minutes into it, they get into the actual FAQs about nutrition questions, things about uh, creatine, things about uh, whey protein, some myths, some legends with it, and a bit of truth as well. So Chasing Excellence um, is the podcast you should be listening to. And with that, we are going to bring up and uh, roll out that conversation I had with Miss uh, Brianna Morse. Uh, enjoy, folks. Okay, so we're rolling now. It's, it's, it's funny how um, the <laughs> dogs will take over not only a space, but the, uh, <laughs> the whole attitude of a room as well. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. And it's like at first they're sitting there very relaxed, probably almost asleep, but you make one move or you, you know, say one thing that, like, piques their interest and they're all over you, you know? Yes, absolutely. All right. So let's, I'd, I'd like to welcome back Brianna Morse to Dog Life <laughs> Radio. And I, I would say this is take two because uh, yes. we spent, a, we had a great conversation. And I have it recorded, but the audio just, it did not work out so good. It was very echoey and um, not the kind of thing that I'm sure either of us would want to put out there. So 
thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to come back and talk with me again um, for, I guess, round two. Yeah, no problem. And I mean, I'm glad that we could do this. And I, I'm curious to see what, un, what unfolds in our conversation this time around compared to last time, because I'm sure maybe some of the same stuff might come up, but it may end up coming across a little bit different because it's been a full week of a bunch of stuff going on probably in our own lives and in the world for sure. Well, absolutely. That's the thing that was so eerie. Because so, so just a little level set, uh, Brown is a, uh, a therapist in South Carolina with uh, personalized as well as remote clients. And we were talking, we, we spent a lot of uh, our conversation about balance in one way or another, whether it was nutritional and, and eating and exercising and emotional balance and, and mindfulness and being happy in your own skin. And literally, I think it may have been the next day or the day after we spoke, news broke about Anthony Bourdain. Uh, committing mm-hmm. suicide. And then, wh- was it a couple of days before that was, was Kate Spade? Yep, yep, the eighth. So a, yeah. Yeah, so literally right around that time from, I wasn't aware of the Kate Spade piece. Um, I, I didn't know that she had, had committed suicide, but we spoke. The Anthony Bourdain pe- uh, news broke, and I was thinking, wow, what a timely conversation that we had, and I felt it was really valuable. And, but to your point, so much has changed, and I, I saw you just paint me with some uh, some information right before we uh, we called about the percentages of uh, suicide by men in, in yeah. um, age brackets and so forth. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, men, uh, the success rate of suicide in men compared to women is so much higher because typically when a male – begins to think and plan out a suicide, they almost always follow through. There's less emotion tied to it compared to to women who, you know, in general, our emotions are just more up and down and a little bit more wishy-washy about things. And men tend to do things a lot more lethal than women do. Hmm. So it's like um, when when a man typically, you know, we're speaking in generalities here, but Mm -hmm. when a man typically... uh, plans to commit suicide it's it's with total success in mind it's like this is how it's going to happen and it's going to be um you know 100 percent gonna go gonna go as opposed to something that might kill me yeah yeah unfortunately you know in in that um ideal of wanting to die you know they end up you know either hanging themselves or using a gun, like I said, it's usually something that's more lethal and will work compared to women who, you know, usually will use overdosing or, um, you know, other other forms that that take a little bit more time or, like I said, like don't have the lethality behind it. Um, Yeah. it, it, It is. It's interesting. It really is. And, like, the statistics, like I was looking at what you sent me about, um, 76% 76% of all suicides are men, um, mm-hmm. and suicide being the biggest cause of death for men under 35. To me, that is absolutely shocking um, for under 35. I, I don't think I would have guessed that at all. Well, you know, it's interesting because I guess I don't know if I would have – I don't know if I would have maybe been as compassionate to the age group 10 years ago as I am sitting in the middle of it, I'm 35. And what I'm realizing and what I'm seeing in parallel to a lot of people in my age bracket, let's just say that like that 28 to 38 year old range, you know, that, that, you know, 30 to 40 year old range, somewhere around there, there is so much loss that happens in different ways. And I think that, our age range has a lot of pressure because we're, you know, really in the, in the full-fledged gauntlet of what life is looking like for us, you know, whether it's marriage or children or divorce or losing a parent or losing a, a grandparent. Like, I, there's a lot of, like, pressure to navigate life differently in our 30s. And I mean, I've, I loved turning 30, and I loved most of my 30s, but I also went through a divorce. I had 
Um, two friends killed within a matter of two years. I, you know, moved across the country by myself. Like, there's a lot of tra- change, and I think a lot of like figuring yourself out again. Um, mm-hmm. And even talking to, you know, friends who have kids or 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 who are in their life transition around my age, it's it's the same thing. Like, man, kids are taking over my life. This is not how I'm used to living. You know, like it is a a, a big, I think, pressuring age. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. When when you get to that point where you know you're you're all of a sudden you're spending your entire weekend at uh, the soccer fields or or the baseball fields or whatever it is because you know the kids are taking up that space or um, just uh, generically when you get to that age when you're in that your your thirties presumably your parents are um, getting older and they're going to start to, mm-hmm. to pass away. I mean, that's just the way it happens. I mean, generally, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later, just, you know, depends on the specific age of your parents. But I mean, that's, that's the thing. I absolutely agree that in your thirties, it all starts to change. It's like when you start to realize, wait a minute, I'm not a kid. I'm, uh, you know, you, and you're not necessarily feeling like an adult either. I remember when I was in my thirties, yeah. I'm in my, yeah, I'm in my mid forties right now, so I can look back on it. But thinking, going, still feel like you're in the 20s, but like the responsibilities generically are shifting. They're shifting. Yeah. Well, I remember being in college and thinking, like, I'm such an adult. <laughs> but now looking back on it, it's like, no, I'm really a, I was really a kid. And then in my 20s thinking, you know, especially going into my profession, I was, you know, I was the youngest person in my building developing a private practice, and I was getting busy pretty quick. And in my head, there was this piece of, you know, feeling inferior to all of these older women and men that I was sharing this building with, thinking, like, I don't deserve this. They're so much more, you know, experienced than me and know more than me. So in my 20s, I was still questioning, like, my capabilities. And so now in my 30s, I'm like, well, wait, I should be at this level, and maybe I'm not yet. Um, So there's that pressure of, like, performance based on, you know, like, where we're at in life. But then also, you know, you're seeing friends in in different you know areas of their life whether it's marriage or kids and and again like I mean I'm not comparing I don't compare myself to my friends like my life is the way it is and there's a reason why and I've got you know lots of growth and and learning lessons from it but you know there's I think there's just this pressure it's almost like being back in high school again like being 15 16 you know and that pressure of like Mm -hmm. you know how you fit in and what's next for you and you know, it's like you're, you kind of replay that again in your 30s. <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. I absolutely agree. I, re, I remember it. I feel it in, in the, your 40s. When you get there, it's kind of similar because you're now mm-hmm. starting to get to that space where, <clears throat> you know, maybe the, both parents are starting to get to that, that point where you're taking full care of them. Uh, you, you know, you, you start to move into your mid to later 40s, maybe they're both passing away, and then all of a sudden you are that upper level of the family tree for all of the people that are collateral and lower to it, where right. for your entire life you were on the lower side. There was always those, the old folks yeah. that were around, whether it's the uncles and aunts or, or grandparents or parents. All of a sudden, that's you. You're the one right. who knows all the answers to everything, and it's just this really weird paradigm yeah. shift where all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, I'm the adult. <laughs> right. Well, and it's interesting because you look back on, I, I had this, um, this, this client that, that's a junior in high school, and she struggled this last year in school. And one of the questions I had asked her was, if you could choose the way you were taught and like the lessons and the subjects that you could sign up for in school, what, what do you wish they would be teaching that you're not getting? And one of the things that she said was, like, I, w- I wish that they would teach us what it's going to be like when we get older. Like, I wish that they could just give us an idea of, like, what to expect, the disappointments and the hardships and the celebrations. And then she also said, I wish that they would teach us more about how to, like, take care of ourselves. And a lot of the topic was based on, you know, like, just emotions and things like that. And I, I couldn't agree more because – you know, we're, we're thrown into subject after subject, and there's all of this information that's being, you know, thrown at us. But we, we're never really taught how to or at least prepare for 
like how to emotionally respond to the pressures and the changes and the expectations that come up as you get older. And my, your generation and, and probably my generation are maybe, I think, a little bit more successful at it because we didn't have as much social media distraction. But what I see from the millennials is a lot of really scary stuff because all the information that they're getting is based on what they see other people doing. Yeah. You know, it's very, it's not, you know, it's not, uh, it, it's just, it's not, it's not a safe way to learn, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. It's true because there's so much information that's available on the Internet, and it's everywhere. And, you know, you can find all kinds of really good stuff that, that is, is true and, and accurate, but to your point, um, very difficult to sift through a lot of the stuff that's crap, that's not true. You can get lost in things. And, yeah, it, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a jungle, you know. <laughs> you think about mm-hmm. it, it's re- re- like you think about um, how do I, uh, <clears throat> you, need, you want a recipe for something. You can look it up and you can find 75 different recipes to make homemade ketchups, you know. So that's, right. that's a good thing, right? That, that's good. But you want to go and find something on um, – uh, history, or, or or why did uh, you know why did the Native Americans um, fight in whatever war? You know you're going to get a, a ton of opinionated things that not necessarily are fact um, can sway you. Then you start to get into the social media aspects of it when you start asking questions on say Twitter or Instagram or, or, or whatever. Then it just blows everything way out of proportion. Like how do I look in this? And then right then it gets it really scary really quickly. Right, right. I have to apologize if you hear background noise. This dog of mine is driving me nuts. He's running all over the place. <laughs> he keeps on getting no, in my No, not, not uh, a problem. That's, that's good okay. stuff. That is good yeah. stuff. We see, I your, mean, that's we see good... your dog in your Instagram posts all the time. Oh, I know. Yeah. One of them is, so Rainy, my Australian shepherd, she's a certified therapy dog. So I rescued her from... Um, uh, actually a rescue that I had started volunteering at as a puppy. And, you know, as an Australian shepherd, I thought, okay, she's going to be super active. And so I did, a drill, I, I did a bunch of agility training and stuff with her. And she was one of those dogs that could care less about the speed and the timing but was just perfect. So it was a very slow moving, like go up the ramp, go down the <laughs> ramp, look around, okay, go through the tunnel. Like she was just always not cautious but just, efficient in the sense of doing it right, but the timing, she could care less. And so (laughs) quickly after that, the lady who was doing the agility training with me said, you know, you should consider getting her certified to do work with you so that you can take her to work. And that was probably the best suggestion that I could have ever gotten. And her and I's um, way of finding each other was like destiny. She has It has been the coolest experience to watch her in a room with some of my clients and know for a fact that if she wasn't there, things would not have unfolded the way that they did in session and stuff would not have come out the same. Like animals are just magic. They really, really are. I absolutely agree. It's, it's, so I'm a huge dog guy as well. It's interesting because the title of the podcast is called Dog Life Radio, but it's, it's not about dogs. It's just, <laughs> it's, I thought of it one day where um, I was watching my dogs and how they live in the moment. You know, they're just so yeah. happy to see you, and, and they, they don't carry this grudge with you and stuff. It's, they're, it's, they're awesome. And it wouldn't, wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to do that? Yeah. So then it hit me that um, all of these decisions that we make in life to kind of uh, – uh, steer us down our path or through our journey are these decisions that can be made in each and every moment. And if we can mm-hmm. actually take advantage of these, take a moment, make the right decisions in the moment, we can make and have impact um, on, on a large scale. Um, mm-hmm. One decision in a day can change um, your entire day. And changing somebody's day can change their entire life. And one person yeah. can change the world. So that moment tied it back to dog life and that's where it came from. So well, dogs are yeah, awesome. I mean, <laughs> I completely agree. Well, you know, they teach us so much about compassion and resiliency and, you know, the ability to can always continue learning, um, you know, like being patient and, 
I mean, they, they are. They're, they're such great learning lessons. I loved when I was volunteering back in California, um, I, I was in charge of taking the more aggressive and more active dogs out, and I would run them for, you know, four or five miles, or I would take them for, like, 10-mile hikes. And, and, you know, I would give these dogs that don't necessarily get out enough the opportunity to, like, actually thrive in their sort of environment where they're by themselves but doing something active. And you could just see it in their face. By the time, you know, you would leave the kennel and their faces would be stressed. You could just feel their energy stressed. And by the time you brought them back, they were so relaxed and so happy. Like, gosh, it was, it was just so much fun to take these dogs out on adventures. Yeah. They're so appreciative in that space, you know. We, um, mm-hmm. I have one uh, a rescue dog, and I, I tell you, that dog was the most well-behaved, and, like, she knew it. And she's just a, just an incredible dog. Um, you always have the joke of she rescued us, that kind of a thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, it's interesting. They, they, um, they teach us a lot about emotional intelligence, if you can kind of sit back and pay attention to it. You know, our, our right side of our brain is where all of our emotional processing comes from. And there's research that shows that if you can touch right brain to right brain, that's like the most, um, that's the most in-depth connection that you can have when it comes to like being emotional with something else. And my other dog that I had to put down in February, um, I would board both my dogs at this horse ranch where I was taking lessons at. And he loved those horses, like loved them. So the, the day before I put him down, I, I asked if I could bring him out to go and hang out in one of the pastures with some of the horses that I had ridden. So I took him out there on his leash, and the horses came running up. And they were all kind of doing this weird thing, flopping their head up and down and, you know, kind of looking around. And then this one horse came from the back and walked right. His name was Sweet Bear. He was so adorable. Like the ugliest dog, but the sweetest dog ever. Came right up to him and put his head down and, and bumped up against Sweet Bear's head and stood there for a second. And then all the other horses turned around and walked away. It was the weirdest thing. But I'm telling you, there is, so, there is something about if you, if you and, you know, that you and I and animals, if we can get to a place where we can really connect on an emotional level, a real level, and that doesn't happen very often nowadays because of social media and I think because of this fear of being judged or thinking we can't really be 100% ourselves, which is showing the real raw emotion, like, it, it does something to a person. It does something to an animal. And I think that's the one thing that as a human race, as, an, as a species of animals, that we all have in common is that emotional connectedness. You, you know, I, I, you hit on something there, right? It's, it's so true where um, you can see people break down quicker and faster and get to the real root of who they are when they're petting a dog, you know? Mm-hmm. You, you mm-hmm. can see it. Like, I, I'm a, I, I think it was before the call, I think I said how uh, right now I'm up at uh, Laconia for Bike Week, the bike rally up in New Hampshire. <clears throat> and you're walking through down the streets with all the, the big bad bikers everywhere. And um, somebody will be walking down the street with a dog, and you'll see this giant six-foot-plus, you know, 250-pound biker kind of squat down and go, oh, you just cute little baby. You just cute little baby. <laughs> <laughs> Because they, they immediately they're not afraid to be vulnerable in that space with the uh, with the animal, you know. Yes. Where with yeah. if you were sitting down with me, I, I don't think they'd be talking like that to me. No, no. But but you're more safe being accepted from an animal than you are from a human because animals don't bear judgment. And I think that, that's, that's it exactly. Yeah, and that's the hard piece is, you know, and I've I've worked with my some of my clients on this is, you know, yes. You, some people don't like you. You're right. Like people are going to look at you and not like you, but that's okay because you're going to have the same amount of people look at you and really like or appreciate something about you. So it's, it, it has to be not about this perception we're trying to give off to be accepted by the few, but giving off what we want to put out as accepting of ourselves. And I think that's the, the hard piece. Um, I'm listening to this book right now, which is 
gosh, it's so awesome. It's a, it's a, it's a long book. I do audio books. I'm not a great reader, but audio for me works really, really well. It's called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, and it's mm-hmm. um, written by Dr. Joe Dispenza. And what he talks about is losing your mind, like losing the perception that you have of who, who you're supposed to be and really creating a new mind based on who you are. And at our core, who we are is our emotions. And they're the really shitty, hard, fucked up ones. You know, the pain, depression, sadness, envy, jealousy, like those are who we really are. And so we have to find out why they're there and where they came from. And until you can do that, you're going to find yourself butting up against the same challenges over and over again in life until you can accept that there's these things inside of us that, that we're trying to run away from. And that's why we butt up against challenges. Um, you know, I'll give you an example in my own life. So, um, for example, in, in my own life, what I know of myself is I, I, there's this part of me that always has wanted to prove myself. And it came from a place a long time ago as a kid of trying to fit in. My family and I, I was born in California, but my family moved to Idaho when I was really, really young, and I got severely bullied for a year the first year I moved there. I was different. I was this toe-head blonde with, you know, dark tan skin, crazy, you know, bright 80s clothing, and I moved to a population town of 5,000 farming community and ranchers. Like, our family did not fit in California to Idaho. And so I learned right away that the only way that I was going to be happy and accepted was if I worked really hard to be somebody else. And so what happened over the years, and this is something that came to me in the last few months in my own therapy, was I have, I have had this mentality of the harder I work, the more I try to make something work in order for me to feel like safe and accepted in something, then I'm going to be happy, which is so far from the truth because I keep running further from myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so, you know, it's just that's an example of how, you know, we tend to hide from the really uncomfortable hard feelings and, and do, you know, some sort of cover up in order to just make things work because we think that's what we need to do. And that's probably where that statistic about the men um, with suicide comes from, right? Because, again, Mm -hmm. typically in painting with a broad brush here, uh, men hide from emotions more so, typically. Mm -hmm. And then with that, that repression, you know, where it's – I don't don't mean to make light of this at all, but have you seen the movie Inside Out? Yeah. The the, the whole point of the movie is about embracing sadness because you you need to have that balance. You need to let it go. You need to grieve. You need to do these things, right? Mm -hmm. And um, when when Mm -hmm. you repress it, bad stuff happens is basically the the point of the movie. Um, But, yeah, no, I I think that makes sense. And it reminds me of the blog that you wrote, um, Changing uh, Changing the View, the one that's on your website, talking about changes, uh, driving, uh, attempting new things, but knowing – you know, you're going to fail, but the failure is good, that type of a thing. So I kind right. of was likening it to that. That was, that, that was uh, connecting. Right. No, and, you know, it's interesting because I think for men, men a majority of the time, they, it's, it's easy to show anger, right? Like anger is kind of like a blanket feeling. You know when someone's angry. But mm-hmm. most mm-hmm. often, anger, again, is a blanket for another feeling. It's covering up what's really going on because some of those other feelings can be really fucking confusing, you know, like disappointment and jealousy and, and envy or, or sadness. Like all of those things are very, very hard. And I think for women, like we express sadness pretty darn good, but a lot of times it's not just sadness. It's something a lot more, more deeper than that. And, you know, until we can really – understand um, and acknowledge what those feelings are like we're, we're never going to really know our own self and know our own feelings and I think that's why I'm just such an advocate of really trying to explore and accept some of that and you know for men I get it like you you guys have been bred to <laughs> be you know be these workhorses be you know, the the stallions that are just going out and do, do, do. So to connect to an emotion, you have to slow down all of that. 
Yeah, and, and that's why one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk to you in the first place, and now again with the second time, um, <laughs> because uh, uh, the connectiveness of the topic of, of mindfulness and, and well-balanced approach to things, you know, having all of these conversations uh, with people about nutrition and exercise, I think is incredibly important. But I think that the, you know, exercising and pushing the mind and resting the mind appropriately is a topic that I want to make sure I, I, I kind of put out there so people can hear about it. And it isn't right. just a, ma- a, a, a male-female, woman-man thing. Um, I think last time we were talking about, um, I think we, we spoke about George St. Pierre, yeah. the mixed martial artist, how he was one of the first uh, guys that I knew about anyway, um, and it was advertised uh, that he had a sports psychologist. And it was really mm-hmm. getting at his mind, his approach from a mind, his mindset, and it's okay. And the guy's the epitome of of masculinity. I mean, he's chiseled. He's this good-looking guy. He's arguably the best mixed martial artist that ever walked the earth. And he went to a psychologist as well. So it's okay. And look at what the results yeah. he's getting. Yeah. Well, and you know, here's the deal. Like my opinion is, is you can't say that you're healthy and you can't say that you're fit if you're not if you're not doing a 360 treatment of yourself, which means you're physically active, you're eating the right foods, you have some sort of mentor, counselor, therapist, or coach that is helping you with the mind and emotional piece. If you're, if you don't have some sort of like spiritual connection, whatever that may be, and, and that you, and and if you don't have like a good community, then you're not fit and you're not healthy. Because just being able to go to the gym and lift and, and just eating the right foods and counting your macros is not going to help you when you experience a huge traumatic event or a loss. It's not going to help you when like everything else in the world falls apart. And so that's the thing for me that I really believe in is health and wellness isn't just about eating and working out. It's a very holistic thing. And, you know, I I mean, I often share because I feel like it's hypocritical of anybody in my profession to say, yeah, come see me for help if you're not seeking your own help, you know. So, I mean, I've been in therapy or coaching in one way or another since I finished grad school. Like, I've always had somebody there to hold me accountable that was outside my friendship circle because, I needed that in order to not only, you know, continue growing personally and professionally, but because I am in no way a, a, you know, a perfect person in my own life. Like, I'm a flawed professional, and I think all of us are flawed. That's the great thing about being human. But what happens is we try to mask all of those flaws in order to show face in some way, and that's not being healthy, in my opinion. No. No, absolutely. And you can look at any professional, any professional athlete and they have a coach. And you can look at any one of those coaches, whether it's their strength coach, conditioning coach, whatever, they have coaches. You, mm-hmm. I've listened to, to dozens and dozens of podcasts where these professional trainers to professional athletes and they talk about how they program, you know, the lifts for this and the nutrition for that. And then they get questioned on, so do you do your own programming? And they go, no, I don't. Mm-hmm. I have somebody else do it for me. Why? Because of everything that you just said. And it, it, it's funny because they know everything that the person is saying, but you need that outside view in. And that's the whole point mm-hmm. of a coach. And, and coaches, like you were talking about coaches and mentors and that, that surrounding network, it's not just one person. It's like it can be all kinds of different groups of people that you bounce ideas off of. You know, you kind of get, get redirection, get affirmation, get, uh, you know, just advice you know, that doesn't seem like the right way to go. We should maybe try it this way, that kind of a thing as well. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know, it's sad because there's no stigma for an athlete to get a coach to help them build a skill. There's no stigma for a person who hires a chef to cook their meals. There's no stigma for someone who hires some sort of like fitness coach to give them motivation and tips on how to work out better. But for some reason, there's this stupid stigma around people asking for help when it comes to how they feel and how they think about themselves and others. And I find it quite ridiculous because that how we think and how we feel is like the 
freaking engine in a car. And so if you're not taking care of that engine appropriately, you're not going to last in any of these other areas anyway because eventually it's all going to fall apart. So, you know, well, absolutely. like, yeah, yeah. And for me, yeah, like, no. that's the piece that I love about working with people is, you know, I'm not some, you know, and I know that we'll talk about this eventually, but if people go to my website um, or people go to my Instagram, like, I'm not some ho-hum therapist that, like, sits with, you know, across from you in this, like, stuffy room and, and you know, wears button-up shirts and a blazer and, and pants, you know, like, <laughs> That's not my style, and I think that's the thing is people assume that meeting with a quote-unquote therapist has to, like, look a certain way. And that's why I started to create this whole different approach to doing therapy and coaching, which is doing it remotely, meeting you where you're at. Like, I meet with people here, and we'll go for hikes and stuff because therapy isn't about just sitting across from somebody. Therapy is about processing and talking and whatever the challenge is, there shouldn't be a stigma around it because, and you and I, we, we already spoke about this. We all live parallel lives in some way. We all suffer. We all have gone through loss. We're, we're all struggling in some way and not asking for help. Like, look what happened to Anthony. Like, it was kept such mm-hmm. a secret. And, and mm-hmm. I think that's the thing is, is, is there doesn't need to be a stigma around having a support system that involves meeting with someone to talk about your thoughts and your emotions. Like, it's a good thing because not only will you eventually discover like some kick-ass shit about yourself that you never knew existed, but like self-awareness and perception of others and, and you know, this need to have a fulfillment, like all of that stuff gets discovered and, and, and built up in a way that then bleeds into these other areas like fitness and eating right and your relationships with other people and all this other stuff. So to me, it's just, it's so crazy. Absolutely. It's, so, it's really messed up when you think about it because, like you said, uh, again, using the professional athlete as, as the, the, the example here, they've got like five, six, seven different coaches from everything, nutrition, training, sports, conditioning, that skill set. Um, but without that actual person to talk to about their mindset, knowing that when they do run into the point where they, they lose or they don't um, you know, score the touchdown, make the basket, win the fight, you will, you will see them that a lot of times you'll see people going, well, they were never the same afterwards. Sometimes mm-hmm. it, maybe it's a physical thing, like in, in, in combat sports, if they got hurt, maybe they uh, physically aren't the same. But I'd say nine times out of ten, it's more yeah. of the mental baggage that goes with it going, I got knocked out by, you know, a, a, a head kick. That way I'm very tentative. I'm always, you know, I'm more timid mm-hmm. in the ring and I never get to get back. Get back. I think, not to name drop or anything, but I think Ronda Rousey is a huge example of that. I mean, she went through and steamrolled everybody for, for you know, a number of years. She got beat badly um, by Holly Holm. She got knocked out with yeah. a head kick, and she was never the same. And it was, I, I guarantee it was not a physical thing. It was more of a mental attachment to it. She seemed like, and this is all based on, you know, what I saw. I don't know her, so I could be way wrong, but... It seemed like she was put into this, this bubble of, of success where she's got all of these people promoting her and pushing her physically and saying, you're the best, you're the best, as opposed to doing that and then saying, here, now let's talk about how we're going to get back because you're human and it's okay to be human. And it doesn't right. seem like that was a conversation that ever happened. Right. Well, and I think it just goes back to that, you know, that thing that we were talking about earlier is we all have so many character flaws, like we do. And the problem is, is it's, we're either too afraid or too egotistical or too prideful to really acknowledge the flaws because then, you know, it, what, it makes us look weak, I guess. I, 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 there's this thing, this cycle of kind of cycle of violence, I guess, if you want to describe it in that way, that, that comes with that protecting the ego from just being able to say like, I feel this way or I struggle in, in this area because mm-hmm. we're seeing all of these other major successful people. We're seeing all these other people manage their shit really well. But, like, even them, they all have issues too. Like, nobody, you know, nobody really wants to share the real raw nitty-gritty stuff anymore. And, uh, you know, that's kind of where I come from in, in my posts on Instagram and 
um, you know, I, I shared with you on this podcast that I'm starting with a friend of mine and is, you know, life is full of shit and life is full of bullshit sometimes and nobody really wants to talk about it. Like it's easier for us to skirt things under a rug and, and not talk about it because then we can hide that piece of ourselves that may look different than who everybody perceives us to be. Absolutely. You can't filter that out on an Instagram post. And it's not mm-hmm. sexy to, to post something about therapy versus the, uh, you know, the ab shot or the double bicep pose or, <laughs> yeah. or, you know, or, or me shooting guns at a target or, or, you know, a motorcycle <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. Right? It's, yeah. it's sexier to do those things, you know. Um, and yeah. yeah, your posts on your Instagram page, I, the reason why I like them is just the, the hiking posts, you know, of course yes. having your dog with you, but just to me, being the outdoors piece is very connected and, and centering for me, and uh, they, they come across great. Thank you. Well, and it's interesting because for me, and I'm sure you have something different as is everybody else, but as soon as I get out on a trail or as soon as I get to a waterfall or wherever it is that I'm hiking, all of a sudden, it's like my creativity just starts flowing. And I've found for me that being out in nature and having silence allows my mind to finally stop for a second and to connect to actually whatever might be really going on internally for me. Like I'm the least distracted. Um, and it just it kind of fills me back up. And, you know, there, there are a lot of studies that show, like, being out in nature, getting outside for at least an hour a day almost resets your, your hormone balances and, and resets any sort of, like, negative cortisol pumping, you know, stuff that's going on in your body and refuels you with the, you know, serotonin and, and the dope, like, the good feelers that then can yep. get your brain back to a centered position again. Because we run so much on that go, go, go adrenaline, and that, that's the poisons our body. It's, it's actually makes it, – it's not good for you. So the if stressors, we're not doing something yeah. to mm-hmm, – so if we're not doing yeah. something to replenish that, um, you know, most often we end up sick somehow. <laughs> no, uh, you're, you're absolutely right because like, you're, you're pushing, you're always doing something um, – and if you're outside and you're not really even taking a moment or so just to kind of, you know, be outside, you know, you're running to your car from the store, from the uh, car to the house, that kind of a thing, that doesn't count. And, mm-hmm. we, and, you know, there's also like, you know, all the vitamin D that you're supposed to get from the sun and people kind of balance that with I don't want to get sunburn and skin cancer thing. And, you know, there, there is that line, but I mean, there is a balance of being able to be protective and be outside and get that type of uh, natural goodness you know um i I, yeah i see it uh i see it here because it's you know mountains and lakes and it's just so gorgeous up here and like i said in the post in your picture when you're hiking uh to me that that is beautiful and i know that there's different things for different people like you live in a city and maybe it's the noise of all the traffic and everything and it kind of is that cool soothing like white noise it blends into that and maybe that's your thing I don't know, not right. for me, but I'm sure it's for some people. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's anything where you're just moving your body, but for me, I just, I believe nature has a grounding effect to it, and being grounded to me means getting back connected to the earth, like rerooting yourself, because a lot of times we're so up in our head and so busy with that to-do list that we don't stop to get centered back into our body. And that's what being outside does, is it gets you back centered to yourself and connected to yourself versus getting distracted by all of these tugs and pulls that we have throughout the day. So, you know, even if, you know, for me grounding, even if it's just getting out and sticking your hands in some dirt or holding on to a rock, Still, there's research that shows that that will help you get back connected to your body because there's this this of the earthness that that reminds you of the 
the distraction, you know, to shut off the distraction because you're being of the earth. That's what the grounding does. So, and for me, that's what, that's what the hiking or getting in the water or, you know, having the dog around is, yeah. Take, how about taking a barefoot walk in, in, uh, in the grass? Oh, my gosh. Nobody of... ever does that anymore. <laughs> I love being yeah. barefoot. I love it. I was, just, I was just having this conversation with a friend of mine. Um, a part of uh, outside my house is filled with rock, and mm-hmm. our feet are just, you know, not like the feet of, let's say, the caveman days, right, where they didn't have any <laughs> shoes. And it hurts, but the more that yeah. you get out there and walk on it, the more your feet get used to it. Not callous, but they just get used to it. And so I've made it a point to go, if I have to go out to my car, I go out there barefoot. And even though for the first few steps, I'm like, ow, ooh, ow. Like, <laughs> you get used to the steps. And it, it starts to release these little pressure points that we have in our feet because we protect them so much with shoes and socks. But like you said, if you, if you can get out and even just take your shoes off for five minutes and walk in the grass, but be mindful, you know, going to that mindfulness piece, what does it feel like? What does it mm-hmm. sound like? What, is it, what are you noticing on your skin? You know, are you beginning to itch or not? Take really slow steps. What are the smells that you're around? The, that's why being out in nature reconnects you to your body because you're actually paying attention to everything around you. You're not paying attention to the spinning that's happening in your head. Yeah, and you're not like, uh, you're not checking your Facebook, you're not checking your Instagram, you're not texting someone. So when you're doing it, don't look at your phone, you know? Put, put the phone down for five minutes, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I, I know we, we spoke about this in our first one about the balance of social, good social media and then overuse and, and, you know, just obsessive behaviors with it. And just to say it so now people can hear it, um, what we spoke about was uh, there's a lot of really good things that can come out of social media. Like the, the fact that I, I, you know, I met you uh, through social media, this to me is a fantastic thing. But then there can become this, this obsessive compulsive thing where you're checking Facebook every five minutes to see if you got enough likes, to see if you got forwarded, to see if you have more followers. All of that kind of a thing, it goes against everything that we were just talking about. So like when you do take that walk out, just stepping out into the grass without your shoes on, don't have mm-hmm. the phone in your hand. You know, don't mm-hmm. look at it. Is it mm-hmm. that urgent? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, we yeah. talked about that last time about, um, you know, how much, again, like technology and social media has taken us away from this connectedness, face-to-face connectedness with, with, with humans, but it's also become just such a distraction to ourselves, and we use it as this reinforcement for likability, um, but also it, it takes us away, again, from really being, being present. You know, like we talked about, I think it was like we take the dogs for a walk, we bring our phones, we can take pictures, but what ends up happening when we take the pictures is we end up like clicking on Facebook just to look and see what's happening, and then we go over to Instagram, Mm -hmm. and then we're back to Facebook, and now all of a sudden you're in Messenger scrolling through, you know, and replying to like three different messages, and you were just supposed to be taking a picture of your dog, and that's it. (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's funny because... And that everybody, it's really easy to do that. And I'm like one of those kooks that actually has to talk to my dog while I'm walking them. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I can't. I can't bring the phone. I, I don't bring the phone with me. And, you know, I do have my moments. Yeah, I'll admit I am flawed and I will. Same. Uh, I will. <laughs> I am. And I go, uh, I will look at Instagram too much or whatever. I'll, I'll dive deep into stuff. But it, shit, you know, whatever. I can put it down too. And that's the part that I feel is even more important. It's like the technology can do connect, such wonderful, powerful things in connecting people who are not in the room with you, but yet yes. it also will build the walls for the people who are in the room for you. It's like how many yes. times have you gone out to dinner, seen a family eating dinner, and everybody looking at their phones? Oh, don't get me started on that. We talked about this last time too. It drives me nuts, especially when parents are giving their kids iPads while they're sitting at the table. And now the parents are talking and the kids are focused on the iPads and the kids are now missing out on role modeling conversations, you know, being social in a social setting, learning how to be bored if that's what they are. Like it drives me nuts. Yep, learning how to be patient. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. It's like... Um, and and it takes away from the creativity. Like go back to bringing like a coloring book and some markers or 
or you know, bringing Play-Doh or, or some sort of fidget thing that they just need to toy with with their hands if they just can't sit still. Like what happened to giving them things that help with their creativity, not with, their, not with distracting them? I think that's you know, what's happened in a lot of this stuff, including social media, is you, know, you can use it for creativity, but what happens is, is it is easily a distraction. So unless you can hone in on having major self-control, you know, we have to get to a place where we're finding ways to connect back to that creativity in ourselves versus being distracted because of whatever, again, going back to the emotions, discomforts or, or challenges we're having that we're not really wanting to deal with. And that's what's happening to the kids nowadays is they don't know how to be bored. They don't know how to be patient because they constantly have something to distract them. Right, because it's the, you know, g- generically speaking, the parent who wants to talk with their spouse or just have a moment of, si- you know, a moment of, of just them um, or want to figure out what they want to eat and they don't want to deal with the kid for a minute, so they put the phone in front of their face. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I work with a lot of parents on, on this specific subject and, um, you know, single parents too. And, and one of the things um, that I always suggest is, is getting – you know, what's called, for instance, like a busy box, especially for younger kids. And what you do is you fill that box with things that that child likes, puzzles, coloring books, Play-Doh. It could be, you know, I don't know, a couple of dolls, whatever it is, whatever the the child likes to do, a, a Lego, you know, some Legos, something. And when, you know, your child, when you need some time alone, you set a timer and you say, I need five minutes. I need you to go to your box and pick something to do because mom or dad has to do X, Y, and Z. So I'm going to set the timer. Do you want to be in charge of watching the timer or not? And, and 99% of the time, that thing freaking works. And, mm-hmm. you know, start with short increments of time so they get used to it. And then you can start adding five or ten minutes here until now your child can, can take your – request of needing some alone time and they know that they need to go to their way of being alone, reading a book or whatever it is, and there's a time limit set on it and they follow through with it and they give you what you need. But we don't do that anymore. We go straight to like, here, use my phone. Here, go to the iPad. Here, watch this on TV. And it's just, it's become, you know, such a habit that... Oh, and it's, it's such a bad habit because it's yeah. easy. And it's funny because yeah. somebody could argue and say, hey, there's ways that you could download apps that they can draw and create on it. And, yeah, that's true, and they're, they're useful and okay, but there's something physical and something tactile and in, in, in grounding and grabbing a pencil and a paper and a pad mm-hmm. and having them draw. Because I know my kids, my daughter absolutely loves to draw. And um, actually, what kid doesn't really? I, mean, I know. Every kid, I know. Every kid loves to. Yeah. But, you know, you give, you give her a pencil and, like, one of those little teeny um, uh, uh, pads that's about the size of a, um, a cell phone, and she'll sit and draw pictures and make stories, or sometimes she'll just write tickets for things, and it's, it's so much more effective than doing it electronically. I'm mm-hmm. a techie guy, but that's, that's the thing. Well, and again, you know, going back to research, and I keep saying research because I'll be quite honest with you. Like, I read a lot about research. I'm not good at memorizing who does it or where it comes from, but I know that I read it and I hear it. But they, you know, they talk a lot about, you know, kids have iPads and stuff at school now too. And Mm -hmm. a lot of schools are using that as part of their teaching tool, which whatever, I mean, uh, we're in a technical world, so I understand. But you know, being in front of a screen for that long is not healthy. It's just oh, you not lose, healthy. You lose a lot of uh, depth perception in the muscles in uh-huh. your, or not muscles, but uh, the, your eye function because mm-hmm. your eye needs, you should be taking breaks. And then when you do that, after looking at a computer screen or, or whatever for a long time, you need to get up and, you know, go outside or look out a window anyway. And you need to look at something that's close and then look at things that are far away so your eyes can adjust. It's almost like working out. You know, it's like using your, your eyes the way they were supposed to be used. If you just sit in one position for a long, long time, you know, your body gets sore, so you've got to get up and stretch. And your eyes right. will, will do that too, and that's how it can be damaging. Right. And I think it just goes back to that thing, you know, even with the kids using the iPads in school and stuff, 
you're not just using one app. Like the, I, you know, that thing that I was sharing with you last week. On average, we, you know, open our email 75 times a day, and we switch screens on our computer like 523 times in one day. There's so much access on our phones and iPads and computers. We can't keep focus, and so if you can get back to some of these more basic ways of uh, you know, if you want to call it grounding, which I think it is, coloring is a very grounding activity. Play-Doh, because you're using something tactile, is a very play um, tactile activity. It, it keeps your focus for longer. And when we get distracted by things, especially in technology or whatever it may be, looking at our phone, it takes you almost 20 minutes to get back to being refocused again because you're still thinking about what you were doing or, or looking at a second ago while you are still having a conversation with someone else. And I'm guilty of it. I, I know that I've done it before. Somebody's talking to me, and I look at my phone, and then I'm like, uh, 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 what was I saying? You know? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's okay. We're all human, right? Yeah, yes, yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's okay to be flawed. Everybody. Yes, everybody it is okay to be flawed. <laughs> it is okay to be flawed. So I want to ask you a question. I want to kind of shift topics just briefly. You had mentioned it a little while ago, and this is one of the new things that has happened since the last time we spoke, which was only a week yeah. ago, your podcast. Yeah. It's called uh, yeah. Starving, Starving Hearts Podcast. Uh, uh -huh. Your partner in crime here is, is it Amber? I'm, yeah, I'm her name is Amber. Amber. Yeah, she, yep, she owns um, a lash studio in Greenville. And for those men listening, uh, <laughs> you know, some of us gals like me, I don't really care to wear a lot of makeup. And so my little special treat to myself is getting some, a little bit of extensions on my eyelashes so it makes me feel at least like my face is done up. <laughs> I actually didn't know they had those things. <laughs> they do, they do. And so, uh, you know, her and I went out a couple of times and spent some time together and, um, you know, we both grew up very, very differently but everything that we would talk about it was like, oh, me too, oh, me too. Oh, me too. And, you know, <laughs> what, we, what we started to realize is, you know, holy shit, there are a lot of us that have very diverse backgrounds and very diverse responses to things happening in our life, but we all share in the experience of it, and we all share in the, in the emotional piece. Her pain may be a lot different from my pain, but we share in the, in the experience of the pain. And... Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, we started chatting about, uh, about this for, you know, quite some time. And then one day we were talking and I said, we need to, we should start a podcast about this. And I've been thinking about doing a podcast for over a year. I just, I, there's something about just talking into a microphone that didn't feel authentic for who I am as a talker and a therapist. You know, like I like to have somebody across from me that I'm conversating with. And like yep. this with you, this has been amazing. Um, and, and so her and I, we, 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 just the other day, we, we've been texting back and forth all of the ideas and all of a sudden it landed to call it the Starving Hearts podcast because we had both realized in our own lives how much we, we've been starving to find this thing that really brings out the happiness. And, and I think for all of us, we all have this, this starving heart to, um, to really be something, to really feel this mm -hmm. fulfillment in some way. But what happens is, is we're looking for things outside of ourselves, our career, our family, you know, our health and wellness. And we put our, our time and our efforts into that. And then we put our actual, again, back to our, to our emotions and, and, and we, we, we put ourselves aside in a way. And so, you know, what we, what we want to strive for in this podcast is looking at um, how you can look inward, that no matter the struggle, no matter the diversity, no matter the challenges that you're, you face, as long as you're feeding yourself in the right way, you're not going to be starving to fill yourself outside. So, That's we're, so we're really cool. I'm so, yeah. I'm really glad that you're doing it. I remember, I, I think you had mentioned um, you were thinking about it, and when I saw uh, the post, I was like, "That's awesome." <laughs> um, I think you it's fantastic. You have to stop thinking I, at some point, right? 
<laughs> and yeah. <just> do. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, when I started mine, it started off a couple of shows were solo um, ones, and they were you know, probably similar to what you're feeling. It's like awkward. It's just like, you know, me ranting. Not really good. And then uh, once I started to interview people, it, it becomes more it, it's really like this isn't an, an interview to me. To me, this is me and you having a conversation. And mm-hmm. it's fun and it's enlightening and I love it because I get to learn all kinds of things and I get to meet really cool people like yourself. And um, that, that's when it gets really fun. And that's why I love it. And it would be much, I, I agree, it would be much better if we were face-to-face. Uh, so I try to do those when I can, but, you know, we, we do the best we can. Yeah, no, and I, I mean, you know, I think for Amber and I, our, our intention in, in this, again, kind of goes back to this place of, especially what I'm learning out here. You know, I, I'm from California, so, you know, I, I think I do things a lot differently. Like, I just say what is, and um, I, I like to, you know, somebody, somebody asks, like, well, you know, what brought you to South Carolina? I'll just say, like, well, I moved out here for somebody, and it really didn't work out. I think here in the South, like, there's a lot of putting things under the rug and, and shelving things and not talking about much. And Amber's not like that. She's one of those ones who likes to talk about things. And so, you know, we came to this realization that a lot of times people don't want to acknowledge the, the real shit that happens in life and that from that shit comes this really great stuff. There's a lot of these breakthroughs that happen from the breakdowns that we experience. And so that's what we want to do in our podcast is not only share in some of our, our own life experiences, but, you know, just like I am to you, have some guests on that, that can really um, validate for all of us the parallels that we live in the loss and the suffering and the challenge, but what comes from that and the realization, mm-hmm. the perception and the awareness that we get from, from these things that happen in our life. So, you know, we're really, really excited. I just have to, um, you know, learn a few things still about posting <laughs> <laughs> you will get there. We will. We will help you out. And uh, thank you. No, it's, it's, you're welcome. It's all good. Uh, it's awesome stuff. If I can figure it out, anybody can. So believe me. Right. I mean. Right. <laughs> believe me. It's it's cool because uh, the way you were describing your show and, and and having your having your co-host there is awesome because you guys can use your own experiences having guests on. And the thing that I'm discovering is. You know, you can have conversations with people all over the country and all over the world, really. And then you can also know that there's always this huge pool of people in your local area. Um, no matter where you are, there's always people around that you can tap into that are more than willing to share their, their stories, whether it's, you know, the stories and themes tied to, to Starving Hearts or tied to Dog Life or whatever. Um, yeah. there, there's always going to be people around. And sharing and having these conversations is tr- it's tribal to me. And, and exactly. Are like, it, isn't yes. it? It's very tri- it's yeah. tribal. You get to connect. You're part of this village. You're having this thing. Like we've bonded now because we did because we did pass even though <laughs> because, of, because of those audio issues. But we've had a couple of conversations um, and it's because of this, this whole experience. So, I mean, how can that not be this awesome, beautiful thing? Yes. I completely agree. I think that's, that's one of the best things about social media is you end up finding people that you may not otherwise ever interact with that you then realize there is such an innate like soul level connection that we normally don't have in, you know, face to face actions with some stranger. Um, yeah. So I do, I do appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so cool. It is so cool. I've got, I think I said it the last time, um, but this, uh, he's a pro strongman, Thomas Wren, down in Australia, mm-hmm. and he qualified for this big, big strongman event here in the U.S., and I've got to make sure I can find my way out to Ohio so, so I can meet him. Yeah. Um, and if, you know if I'm ever down in South Carolina, I'll, uh, I'll oh, shoot yeah, you a you'll message have to for sure. Yeah, yeah, I would love <laughs> I, that. I would love that. Well, it's funny because I, um, I developed a friendship with a gal out here just off of friending her on Facebook. When I was moving out here, there were some things that I wanted to do, and one was get some professional professional pictures taken for my website. And so I found this gal, and I friended her, and she had told me, she had, you know, didn't a- approve the friend request for a while, and then all of a sudden I had this message in my inbox, and it said, 
hey, I deleted your friend request because I thought you were one of those like sex ladies that was looking for like people to, you know, follow them on <laughs> Facebook and like have sex with them. And so I saw these pretty pictures of you and thought, oh, this is a fake scam account. So I deleted you. But then I had this <laughs> gut feeling to go back and I started reading your post and realized you're a really cool girl. So I sent you a friend request if you still want to be friends. And her and I have now developed this awesome real-life friendship. She lives about um, 40 minutes from me, but we talk on the phone all the time. We go out to lunch or go out to dinner. She'll call me with her challenges. I call her with my challenges. And it's so funny because I would have never met her if it wasn't for Facebook, you know? That is quite the story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but that's exactly it. You're going to find people around it. It's a cool experience having a podcast. I think I, I think everybody who ever you know thinks about doing it should do it. It's not like this whole competitive thing where no, you it's can't not. because you're going to steal my listeners. No, it's all, we help each other, and it, mm -hmm. it's, it's awesome. That, that's mm -hmm. fantastic. So uh, let's see. That, we spoke a little bit about your website, but um, you want to hit your website and your yeah, Facebook and all that where people can find you. Yeah. So. Cool. Um, you mentioned it at the at the beginning, but I just I want to reiterate. Um, I'm a licensed therapist in in California. I still ha hold my license there. Um, out here in South Carolina, there's been a little bit of roadblocks and stuff going on. But what I've been able to do is just change some of my quote unquote therapy practices into coaching. And so I'm I'm doing remote um, therapy and coaching, and I do in home. Um, and community visits as well. And you can check out what that looks like on my website, which is www.briannamorse.com. And that's Brianna with an O, B-R-I-O-N-N-A. Um, and now, because I've, you know, shifted some of how my practice works outside of California, I'm, you know, seeing clients in Pennsylvania and Maryland and Texas and North Dakota. Where else do I have? Florida. So I, I love it because, um, you know, and we have these really busy lives, and yet there's still a need and a space to, to make sure that you're supported and, and okay. Um, and so to have one less appointment to have to go to is what my remote coaching and therapy has really been beneficial for those who have these crazy, chaotic, busy lives as they get to be home and in their PJs half the time, and we, you know, have our hour session, and then they get to either, you know, relax the rest of the night or, you know, get ready for work or whatever it may be. So it's, it's been really, really, um, you know, helpful in that way. So, again, they can check out that website. You, you know, anybody who's interested is more than welcome to follow me on Instagram. It's just my, my name, Brianna Morse. Um, uh, a lot of what I post is – you know, then shared in a in a longer blog on my website, and um, I I just I love sharing about what I'm going through because I know I'm not the only one, and sometimes I have aha moments, and other times I'm just like, what the fuck am I doing? So you know, <laughs> and I feel like that's fair too that other people are 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 in that. So you know, if 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 you can relate, like I I love when people. I don't care about the likes. I really don't. I just want the engagement. I want the acknowledgement that, like, I'm not the only one. And I want somebody to else to say, like, man, I can relate to that. I was just going through that last week or, you know, asking me a question about how I was able to get through it. That's the stuff that I love. So if you're somebody who, you know, wants to be validated and, and loves to exchange in conversation, you know, please follow me on Instagram or, um, you know, hit me up in an email or something like that and we can chat. So, very cool. And don't yeah. forget your Instagram for your uh, yeah, podcast, and if you're, right? Yeah. And for any, you know, I know that some of your, I know you've got a diverse population of, of listeners, but for any of those, you know, hardworking men of yours listening that just have a little bit of a soft side they want to keep hidden, you can go over to um, Starving Hearts Podcast uh, Instagram and hit a follow there and and listen in secrecy and not tell anyone, and hopefully it will be beneficial for, for everyone. Um, so that, that's going to be launching really soon, but you can go over and start hitting a follow over there to start getting information on, on what's going on with Starving Hearts Podcast. So. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to come back and talk again with me. I really appreciate it. Uh, this was an awesome talk. Same, Rossi. Thank you so much.